Next up, Sam Harris, um, author of the New York Times bestsellers, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, co-founder of The Reason Project, and just completing, <laughs> still completing, his uh, doctorate in neuroscience. I've never <laughs> you see that Yeah, Sam Harris. Thank you, Jonathan. You were very Christian. Now I'm going to repudiate everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so as some of you know, my, one of my primary concerns is the way in which neuroscience and our, our understanding of ethics and human well-being at the, at the level of the brain is going to transform our notion of right and wrong and good and evil. And a, a plausible title for this talk would be, can we ever be right about right and wrong? Um, it seems to me that to understand our minds at the level of the brain would be to understand all of those forces, reciprocity and intuitions of fairness, um, openness to evidence and argument, all of, the, all of the things that allow friends and neighbors to collaborate together on the, on the common projects of civilization. And I think using this knowledge to help improve our circumstance is one of the primary challenges to science in, in the coming decades. Now, as I think all of you know, David Hume quite famously told us that you can't derive an ought from an is. And G.E. Moore followed him and said that any attempt to locate morality in the, in the natural world would be to commit the naturalistic fallacy. And many other philosophers have followed suit. Karl Popper echoed these notions. I think it's, I think it's difficult to overstate the effect of this line of reasoning in Western science and psychology. I mean, this, this has essentially created a firewall between facts and values in our, in our discourse. And while psychologists and, and neuroscientists study morality and positive emotion and human happiness now, they very rarely make normative claims about how we th should think and behave in light of their findings. I mean, it seems to be generally thought uh, somewhat intellectually disreputable or even vaguely authoritarian for a scientist to ever say that there's something in his research or her research that actually should guide us in how we live our lives. Now, scientific reticence on the subject of norms, I think, has, has come at a terrible price. It, it has made science appear divorced in principle from the most important questions in human life. It, it has made science seem like a mere incubator of technology. And, and religious people, in all faiths, and on both sides of the political spectrum, are united on precisely this point. I mean, they, though they can ag agree about little else, they agree that scientific methodology and modes of reasoning and standards of evidence have no application whatsoever on questions of meaning and morality and goodness and, and value. And as, as comes as no surprise, the most common justification one hears for belief in God now is not that there's compelling evidence that God exists, but that belief in him is the only source of meaning, moralities, and value. It seems to me that, that the doubts we have in this community, the scientific community, about the application of scientific reasoning to, to meaning and morality has, has given a mandate to superstition and therefore sectarian conflict. And the greater the doubt, the greater the, the impetus to nurture divisive delusions. In the public imagination, evolution is, is equated with selfishness as some kind of biological imperative, so that it, it, with the absence of a morality, essentially. And the fact that we haven't demolished this fallacy has been extremely unhelpful, both for the, the practice of science and for the, the public understanding of its products and, and the importance of scientific thinking and the difference between scientific thinking and the rest of, of what we do with our lives. Now, needless to say, human cooper cooperation and its attendant moral emotions is perf they're perfectly compatible with biological evolution. I mean, we are not merely atomized selves disposed to serve our own interests. We, we are also s s social selves disposed to serve a common project with others. Now, it's true that there's a limit to our sensitivity and concern for the suffering of others, but those limits are themselves part of our personal and collective concern. 
Right? Most of us want other people's hopes to be realized. Most of us want to live in, in fair and just societies. And most of us want to leave the earth a better place than we found it. Now, claims about morality and human well-being are claims about the architecture of our minds and the social architecture of our world. And so as such, there are claims about facts. I mean, there are claims about facts constrained by natural law and statistical law. And as such, a person can be right or wrong or more or less informed with regard to them. And this is not to say that there's only one moral precept in any given situation. I mean, morality can be a lot like food. It's not like there's one right food. But there is still an objective distinction between food and poison. Okay, there's a biologically contingent distinction, there's a historically contingent distinction perhaps, but we're still in the range of, of objectivity here. So it's possible to be mistaken about what will actually maximize human well-being. And it's possible for groups of people to be mistaken. It is, therefore, possible to be part of a pathological culture or subculture. There is such a thing as moral high ground, and it is possible not to be standing on it. Now, I think, so I think there is little doubt that we will one day come to understand right and wrong and good and evil in scientific terms. One moral outlook will be truer than another if its view of the relation between thought and intention and emotion and behavior and human well-being is truer than another. And because human well-being is realized at the level of the brain, an emerging and, and maturing brain science will have a lot to say about right and wrong and human well-being. So hence, I think there is unavoidably a collision coming between science and popular opinion on this, on this terrain, just as there has been on evolution, on, on what it is to, to, to flourish, on, what, on what, it, what goodness is in the public domain. And I think, obviously, definitive answers on certain questions are already within reach. I mean, it does, does forcing women and girls to wear burqas make a net contribution to human well-being? I mean, does it make for happier men and women? Does it make for more compassionate men or more confident and, and contented women? Does it make for better relationships between girls and their fathers or boys and their mothers? I think the answer, we do not need an NSF grant to make headway on this. That the answer is, is in plain view. And yet most scientists have been trained to think that this kind of judgment is, a, is a, a kind of cultural imperialism. Who are we to say that the denizens of this ancient culture should conform to our notions of gender equality? Who are we not to say that? I mean, in, in this case, we're talking about a culture, or a, at the very least a subculture, of the purest misogyny and religious bamboozlement. Now, students of philosophy or at the very least, Pat Churchland, will know that I'm, I'm now committing myself to some form of moral realism and some form of consequentialism. I'm saying, one, that, that moral truths exist, and two, they relate exclusively to the well-being of conscious creatures like ourselves. Now, as many of you know, moral realism and consequentialism have both come under pressure in, in philosophical circles. And unfortunately, in the space of 15 minutes, I don't have time to to fully uh, prop up both of these views, that will be the subject of a long and boring chapter in my dissertation. Uh, but I think I should touch on a few points. Consequentialism has been a notorious engine of moral dilemma. I mean, should I, for instance, uh, is it ethical for me to save the life of my only child if this causes me to neglect to save a, a stranger's brood of eight? Uh, Many smart people who have thought about problems like this have, have come to think that morality doesn't uh, track the laws of arithmetic. And in fact, it may not. It, it seems to me quite possible, if given an eternity to think about it, that we might all agree that, 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 be, that having a bias towards friends and family may actually be preferable uh, than a society in which we, that we, we're all dispassionately 
um, unconcerned about how consequences accrue. Uh, it, it could be that there are certain forms of love and happiness that are best served by this kind of, of emphasis uh, on a subset of humanity, or maybe not. Or maybe there are two possible worlds, each of which maximizes the, the, the well-being of its inhabitants to, to the same degree. And in one, people are, are particularized toward friends and family, and in, and in another, there's, there's true dispassion there. I um, mean, this, this could be considered two peaks on a moral landscape, and there may be others. Would this be a problem for consequentialism or moral realism? I don't think so. I mean, even if there were 10,000 peaks on the moral landscape, all of equivalent well-being, okay, it still would be objectively true to say that there are better and worse ways to move from our present position to one or another local maximum. And movement would still be a matter of increasing well-being. It seems to me that the existence of moral truth that is, the existence of lawful connections between how people think and behave and human well-being is not predicated on our ability to, to define morality in terms of, of unvarying moral precepts. I mean, morality can be a lot like chess. You know, there, can be, there can be principles that generally apply, like don't lose your queen, but they can admit, admit of, of contextual uh, exceptions. And this would not change the fact that from any current position on a chessboard or a moral landscape, there are objectively right and wrong moves. So now, if there are objective truths to be known about human well-being, if kindness, for instance, is generally more conducive to human happiness than cruelty is, then there seems little doubt that science will one day be able to make very precise and strong claims about human morality and what behaviors are good, and what are neutral, and what are wrong and worth abandoning. Now, and, unless you think, by some miracle of coincidence, that every culture in the world today, and every subculture, has these principles equally well in hand, then you have to expect that, that science, in coming to understand the requisites of human well-being, will expose certain cultures, and subcultures, and economic arrangements, and political persuasions as being needlessly subversive of human happiness. It will be scientifically true to say that some cultures are better than other cultures, in that they are better at producing human lives worth living. Now, to bring it back, as I, as I often do, to what I consider the, the especially low-hanging and rotten fruit of traditional Islam, I think there is no reason whatsoever to think that demonizing homosexuals, stoning adulterers, soliciting the murder of novelists and cartoonists, or worshiping suicide bombers constitutes a valid strategy for maximizing human well-being. This is, I think, as objective a claim as we ever make in science. Now, the re obviously, the reasons why such behaviors don't maximize human well-being is susceptible to myriad levels of analysis, economic, psychological, social, and ultimately neurobiological. I mean, to understand human well-being, we have to understand the human mind. To understand the human mind, we have to understand the brain. Now, many people doing research on the neural basis of human well-being and, and moral judgment uh, someone like Joshua Green, who's doing fMRI work, or Jonathan Haidt, who's doing psychological research, believe that it is irrational to expect this much of rationality. Okay, this is, this is for them, it seems to me that moral reasoning is, is essentially aspirational in character. That the hope that we may fuse our moral horizons with the rest of humanity is, is not only vain on their terms, it is symptomatic of the very unconscious bias uh, that, that I would pre presume to get rid of in the first place. We take, for instance, my feeling that, that, that um, it is a bad thing that Sarah Palin may be the next vice president of the United States, or indeed president. Okay, to, to my eyes, she is, she is uh, shockingly unqualified. Okay, but on, but on their analysis, this just may be a symptom of my liberalism, my liberal bias, my elitism, 
my lack of, my blindness to other sources of value. So someone whose chief moral concerns are God, guns, and gays, and who's awaiting the rapture, which incidentally is a time where all, most of the people on the planet get hurled into a lake of fire for eternity. Okay? Someone like, with that set of moral concerns is just as good a judge on morality as a John Rawls or a Derek Parfit. Okay, that is essentially the situation we're in. And scientists, many scientists object to moral realism of the sort I'm espousing because there's simply too much diversity of moral opinion for us to ever say there's a fact of the matter about right and wrong or good and evil. I mean, too many people think homosexuality is evil for us to ever say that they're wrong. That's really what it comes down to. But is scientific truth ever predicated on a real consensus of this sort? I mean, it seems to me quite obvious that there is a greater consensus among homo sapiens at this moment that cruelty is wrong a core moral principle, then that um, the passage of time varies with velocity, as suggested by special relativity. Or that, that, that plants and animals have a single common ancestor, as suggested by evolution. I mean, is our physical or biological realism even slightly predicated or put in jeopardy by the fact that most Americans repudiate the insights of Einstein and Darwin? Why should, why should a diversity of moral opinion pose any more difficulty than this? I mean, it seems pretty clear that, that most people are simply ignorant about the true basis of human well-being and therefore the true conversation we should have about morality. In the same way that most people are ignorant about biology and history and chemistry and everything else worth understanding. So one of the, the, the problems I have with... with uh, Jonathan's research um, is the fact that he seems to, to, to consider it a virtue to take the moral categories of his subjects at face value, the, the, doing purely the descriptive research without looking at the, the scientific uh, judgments we can make about normativity. I mean, a majority of Americans believe that the Bible is an accurate account of history. Many millions of Amer Americans believe that that the primary cause of cancer is repressed anger. I mean, happily, we don't let these opinions anchor us when we talk about history or on oncology. And while few scientists think of themselves as moral relativists, and I don't know if Jonathan would, would describe himself that way, it seems to me that is what they, they offer in the face of moral diversity. I mean, when the United Nations was, in 1947, trying to formulate its, its uh, view on universal human rights, the American Anthropological Association issued a statement saying, morality is cultural spe culturally specific and you cannot ever describe one value system as trumping another. Okay, it, it was 1947. The crematoria of Auschwitz were still warm. Okay, and this is the best our social scientists could do. It seems to me the lesson to be drawn here is, is Awareness, awareness of moral diversity is a very poor surrogate for clear thinking about human well-being. So now charges of scientism can't be long in coming. Uh, I think I, 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 I want to say that this is not a utopian view. I don't think that we're necessarily ever going to arrive at a complete consensus of, of normativity. But to Total consensus is, is, is not what we arrive at in science. It is, it is something that, that exists only at the hypothetical end of inquiry. I don't see why we shouldn't tolerate open-endedness on the subject of human well-being in the same way that we, we tolerate it on, on all other scientific questions. So it seems to me, in, in closing, that Herbert Simon's notion of bounded rationality could be very useful here. And we could think in terms of bounded utility. It may never be possible to reconcile all of the competing utility claims or even become aware of all the competing utility claims of billions of creatures. I mean, we can't even, we can't even reconcile our own utility claims. I mean, we, we, we want to lose weight and we want the ice cream. Life is complicated. Uh, what we can do, it seems to me, is try within practical limits to seek a path that maximizes our own well-being and the well-being of others. And to become increasingly sensitive to the way in which 
these are, this is not a zero-sum game. That, that the personal and collective well-being are interdependent. It seems to me this is what it means to live wisely and ethically, and we have a moral obligation as a community to articulate the difference between real moral wisdom and its many counterfeits. It's, it's one thing to understand human confusion. It's another to help remedy it. And I think, what, it, what would a maturing science of the mind be for, if not the latter project? Thank you very much. <laughs>